So, all right. So with us, we have uh, filmmaker Rashad Ernesto Green, who made the features Gun Hill Road and Premature, which was released this February. Uh, he won the Summon to Watch Award and was nominated for the John Cassavetes Award at the 2020 Independent Spirit Awards. His TV credits include shows for Marvel, Netflix, Show Showtime, Hulu, NBC, Fox, Warner Brothers, VH1, and BET. Uh, Laura Heberton is an award-winning producer and screenwriter whose features have premiered at top festivals. Uh, directors she's worked with include Jennifer Reeder, Robert Mashoyan, uh, Rodrigo Hoito Beck, Josephine Decker, Allison Bagnell, and Matt Porterfield. Her projects have been supported by multiple, uh, multiple times by SF Film, Austin Film Society, and IFP. Uh, Minette Louie. Minette. Minette, I'm sorry. I've always called you Minette. Minette. Uh Everyone gets it wrong. <laughs> Manette Louie is an Emmy-nominated Spirit Award-winning producer whose credits include 2020's I Carry You With Me and Swallow, as well as The Tale, Gemini, Busters, Malhart, The Invitation, Lan Ho, Children of Invention and Mutual Appreciation. She's on the board of uh, directors for Film Independent and is a, me and is a member of the Academy. Uh, producer, writer, educator Mike S. Ryan uh, has worked with such directors as Hal Hartley, Todd Solins, Kelly Reichert, Bella Tarr, Rick Alverson, Ira Sachs, Gaspar Noé, and Jake, Ma it's a Mahaffey? It's Mahaffey, right? His films have played and won awards at the top festivals and have been nominated by the Oscars and Spirit Awards. He's a member of SAG-AFTRA and of the Academy. Direct writer, producer Dan Schoenbrunn is the founder of the Ice Slicer Touring Variety Series, the omnibus film Collective Unconscious, as well as the Radical Film Fair. Their directing credits include A Self-Induced Hallucination and We're All Going to the World's Fair, which is currently in post. He produced, uh, they produced The Future, Chain for Life, and Random Acts of Flyness. Producer Susan Stover's most recent feature is 2020's South Mountain. She produced John Leguizamo's Latin History for Morons, the IFP Gotham Awards, and the film, film's River of Grass, Welcome to the Dollhouse, Love God, The Sticky Fingers of Time, High Art, Laurel Canyon, Ode, Happy Accidents, The Business of Strangers, One Last Thing, Syrup, and Glass Chin. So, obviously we've got a breadth of filmmaking experience uh, amongst these folks. Um, some of it ultra low budget, some of it regular budget, whatever that may be. Uh, and uh, uh, we're gonna delve into a bunch of different questions here about where things stand and where we think things may be going and if there are any silver linings in what we're all going through and seeing right now. Um, so first off, I want to um, just delve into the question of the status of, of your current films, um, current whether they are in production, in post-production, in distribution, in development. Um, you know, let's try to be brief about it. I'm sure you guys have a million different things you're working on at once. But if there's anything that you think is relevant to this moment, uh, I, I think it'd be interesting to hear where, where you're at. Um, do you want to start, Mike, since you, you seem to have a bunch of things that are in, in, uh, in pause, I guess, right now? Yeah, so I, I, it's just a coincidence, I guess, but I have four feature films that were all just about to hit the market uh, from the past. I had a very busy uh, 18 months after I got back from China. I got bogged down in China for over close to a year. And uh, so uh, one was about to be released April 3rd. That was my Bruce Dern, Lena Olin film. And that was going to be in theaters starting April 3rd, multiple cities gone, you know, delayed to the fall, which, you know, we can talk about is probably it's gone away. And then I had um, uh, a film that um, wa that uh, played indie Memphis premiered Faith. And that is uh, got picked up by Vertical and that will be going straight to streaming. That was supposed to have a theatrical component in a small rollout and that's all been put on hold. So that'll probably go straight to, you know, continue with the digital rollout. And then a new Jake Mahaffey film with uh, Julia Orman that I shot in New Zealand that uh, was just about to start the festival run. And uh, with Locarno and a whole lot of festivals uh, going down, you know, that whole thing is, is now in question and I'm going straight out to streamers for a sale and probably going to bypass the whole festival run for that film. It's a, it's a, it's a art horror character driven, so it can do that. And then I have another film that I shot in New Orleans in December, which is a straight art film, very with Joe Cross called Stay at Condor Beach, which could not go straight to the streamers because it's such an, um, an oblique structure and it was shot on 35 millimeter film. And so that we're like, and hold 
for an unknown about a festival. It couldn't make Khan. It wouldn't be a Khan type film, but it would be possibly, you know, another type of European festival. And so that's also in hold. So I'm in four different types of hold right now, basically. Mm -hmm. Dan? Uh, we got very lucky with production uh, and wrapped. I, I just directed my, my first feature, my first narrative feature, um, micro budget, uh, horror drama, um, very small and sort of art driven film. Um, we wrapped March 1st, like seven days before quarantine. Um, and so the timing was great in that regard. We got very lucky. Um, and it's very nice to have space and time to edit and not have to worry about festival deadlines necessarily. But, um, you know, every time we try to talk about what landscape we'll be introducing this film into, it's a lot of question marks right now. So it's interesting in that regard. Now, Manette Rashad, you just released films, correct? Yeah, not first. We can talk first. Right before he, he went first, and then I went the following week. Yeah. Oh, that's right. So yeah, you, know, you were on Swallow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, premature was my second feature. Just premiered late February, and yeah, and then I guess early March, uh, the entire theatrical run was uh, was canceled uh, in in the remaining cities. And yeah. where is it? Where is it now? Uh, right now it's available on VOD um, and will be available on streaming on Hulu as of May 22nd. Mm -hmm. um, but right now you can purchase it on Amazon Prime and uh, iTunes and, and, and these kinds of uh, uh, outlets. Okay. Yeah, I think Premature released the week before Swallow did. Both were IFC films. And um, so Swallow came out on... March 6th, uh, it was always going to be a day and date release. So we were already on all of EOD platforms at the regular price point, not the premium price point. So $6.99 for a rental at, on iTunes, Amazon, et cetera. Um, I've, and then the following week, we, were, we opened in three theaters in New York and LA. And the following week, we we're supposed to expand to 38. That didn't happen because that the following weekend was um, when the shutdown started happening. Um, but we actually, I feel that we benefited. Our VOD numbers are pretty awesome. And I think we benefited from having a captive audience at home and being one of the few new films available at home. Um, and also the press had nothing to write about. <laughs> so our, our film continues to be reviewed. Um, almost every day there's a new review, which is pretty cool. Um, and then I have a film that was slated for release um, that pr premiered at Sundance 2020 um, called I Carry You With Me by Heidi Ewing and that was supposed to be released by Sony Classics on June 19th. Now it's TBD. No idea when it's going to premiere. Maybe the fall, but I have no idea. Um, so that's on hold right now. And then I have two films in post. I also shot in New Orleans, Mike, um, in December. Um, but it was a film that already had distribution. It was um, an Amazon Blumhouse feature, sci-fi feature. Um, and then I have another film in post um, that I exec produced that I shot in Buffalo, New York in December called Catch the Fair One by Joseph Vladica. And that one is a festival film and um, we're trying to figure out, it's in post right now, we're editing it, we're trying to figure out what to do with it, whether to even apply to the fall festivals or not. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, Laura, Susan, anything that's in the cooker? Um, very, very similar. South Mountain was had a theatrical release the first week of March, I guess it was, um, or second week. Small theatrical release, New York and Los Angeles, and it was canceled. Um, it will appear the next week on VOD, and we'll just take it from there. So it's disappointing. I mean, it was a small theatrical release, but that's the reality, and that's how we're dealing with it. And hopefully we will benefit from, as Manette said, the sort of captive audience. Um, not a lot of new content being released other than some of the docu-series on Netflix. Um, so hopefully we are trying to capitalize on that as well. Otherwise, in terms of production, I was on the commercial side about to go into commercial and that went, we pulled the plug in the middle of February, which was kind of interesting. We were supposed to shoot the first week of March. It was interesting because it was for a pharmaceutical firm. Um, 
So I think they may have known a little bit more than a lot of people knew. So that went down quickly. We're ready to go, in fact, whenever we can, which is the question, when can we? Um, we've had to kind of re-script it and think of some other more safe ways to do this content. But um, other than that, I'm developing them. Um, uh, I'm developing a couple of things. So in some ways, this is kind of ideal. There's time to write and think. Um, but other than that, or some time to write and think, it's um, interesting. But I think for most of us, we're anxious to start shooting again, but we want to shoot in a very safe way, in a way that's not going to be harmful. We'll get more into that. So Laura, any, yeah. anything for me? Yeah, I had a first feature. I mostly do ultra low budget uh, films with first and second time uh, feature filmmakers. It's the space I love to work in. Um, and I had a film, gorgeous film, that was meant to premiere at South by Southwest called mm -hmm. Freeland, starring um, Cresha Fairchild and mm -hmm. Lily Gladstone it's in it too. Um, and that obviously didn't happen. So now um, ICM is handling sales for it and we're just all at, sort of on pause at the moment, waiting for things to sort of settle down and see what happens. I mean, we had got already gotten into a lot of festivals, but almost all of them have been canceled mm -hmm. um, and postponed. And every day I get another email from a festival that's been canceled or <laughs> postponed. Um, and then I have a film, again, a first time, a first time narrative feature film uh, starring Lily. Um, that's totally coincidental. Um, and we were meant to shoot the very last week of production at the beginning of April, because that's a film we've been shooting with, uh, with the seasons. And uh, that obviously got uh, put on hold, but luckily it's a very pared down shoot. We figured out a way to really pare it down. Um, it's really only Lily's in the, in those scenes. And so we're hoping to be able to shoot that once we can, you know, get things up and running with, and there'll be five people on set all together. So including Lily. So we're hoping that can be done sometime this summer. We can finish that film up. And then I have a few uh, scripts and, and, and projects in development. So, all right. Um, so, I mean, before this all happened, we were, you know, in the indie filmmaking world, uh, most of us were talking about, you know, this kind of a, been a crunch anyway. There's always seems to be a crunch on the low budget indie film world uh, in terms of like peak TV and the market plays kind of a wash in choices, uh, theatrical kind of falling apart. And I'm curious where you guys, where your heads are at in terms of uh, how existential or not the current situation feels for on the low budget end for films that want to be in the below or must be in the below $2 million end. Are we, are we feeling that this is a, a temporary setback or that this is a, a bigger thing that's going on? Feel free. I, I I mean, I think it's, I mean, I, I think that those who know how to make low budget movies, independent movies are in a good position. We know how to work small. Um, we often work with the same people over and over. So we, there's a certain level of trust with small crews. And we've always been um, resourceful in getting around things. Uh, in a smart way. So I think it's it's not bad news for that space, that size of filmmaking. Um, when I read articles about other, you know, Hollywood's plans to reopen and the suggestions are, you know, still for crews that are three or 400 people, um, it just, that seems undaunting to me, but I think we, people on this panel for sure we are in a good position um i think there's other gatekeepers out there whether it's insurance where it's permits whether it's um vendors that are still around when we reopen that may present a bigger issue for us yeah i think insurance is the biggest issue actually yeah. so i mean without insurance covering any covid related shutdowns um you're going to have to find a financier who's willing to carve out a huge contingency in the budget. And it's already challenging um, 
to have any contingency at all in budgets this size. You know, on top of that, the extra costs that, you know, you'll have for, you know, all the additional secure, security measures and health measures. Um, I just, I think it's going to be really tough. Um, and my hope actually is that studios might start financing these smaller films and these smaller scope projects yes. because there's nothing else they can do. They can't shoot a film with a crew of 300 right now. Exactly. So that I'm hoping they'll like divert their resources to making smaller films. So this could be a new golden age of Hollywood, of art house. You know, it took a pandemic to get Hollywood to make art house films again. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. And there may be more of this sort of negative pickup that we haven't been seeing that much of. Um, where the money's there, you guys go shoot it and we'll buy it. Um, I think the insurance is an issue. I mean, I guess if you, in a current situation of your, your policies, so, so this COVID shutdown is a big question as with the workers' comp issue, um, which most employers should probably be shielded from some liability. I'm not talking about the, you come to work and you don't, I, I'm talking about just in terms of um, operational. It is a challenge and I think the permits, I don't think the New York City is issuing home permits at the moment. So um, but there's ways around that too, as we know. Um, but I do think it's a possibility. There is silver lining. There, there is a possible silver lining. I think the question for me that seems, uh, uh, you know, and it's probably because I'm nearing the stage with my first feature. I, I have a lot of friends and collaborators early in their careers with, with smaller films, um, distribution, and just the way that, depending on how long this lasts, the outlets for discovery and how those will be changing seems to be the big question for me. Um, and, you know, without the sort of laurels of festivals or laurels that are just based online, like how, how do discoveries happen? Um, and will there be new systems through which people can sort of seek out work that isn't already funded by a studio or already has like some sort of bigger sort of hook to it. Yeah, I mean, I think in the, in the short term, you know, I think until there's a vaccine, we're gonna, we're gonna find ways to make our small films, that's gonna happen. My concern has to do with, you know, this virus accelerating trends that were already happening. And mostly, you know, Netflix has been financing low budget films before, but they have a very limited definition as to what's an acceptable feature. Yep. Um, and personally, in my aesthetics, it doesn't fit in with that. And so I'm deeply concerned about the theatrical space uh, and a, a mm -hmm. life outside of streaming's dominance. Um, and streaming's dominance just doesn't mean that they're in every home. It means actually an aesthetic dominance. We're talking about minds that have been have been capitalized by a concept of narrative, which is, in my opinion, extremely damaging to our idea of narrative cinema. Um, mm. And so I'm, I'm concerned with that counterpoint, where w w will the Roxy in San Francisco survive? Like, that's, that's my concern, you know? Uh, and I don't want Netflix to buy the Roxy. I don't want, and I'm, I'm just mentioning Roxy, just, it's just a, one, one of many theaters that I'm thinking about that's a theater that I like and I'm at often. But I don't want the streamers domination to increase uh, even more. And indie is a place for counterpoint against dominant narrative. That's yep. you know, indie's first mm -hmm. filmmaker, you know, was Oscar Michaud who was fighting against dominant ideology. And, and so that's what I'm concerned with. And, and, and I don't know how that's going to play. That's a very good point. Yeah, um, so it's, it, it's a good question. So do we think that there are, do we think that there's certain kinds of films that are going to not be made? Well, the $1 million, you know, uh, Moonlights and uh, Ghost Stories and even, you know, weirder fare not, find a way to get financed and created uh, and for how long, if that is the case, any, any stabs at that? Well, I think Mike's point is a good one, which is that these are, there are trends being accelerated, but 
the films that you mentioned to me are real outliers in American independent filmmaking to be made at that budget level and to be able to break rules of tone, aesthetics, pacing, even just coverage, the way they're shot. Um, it, uh, unless there's some sort of real seismic hype built around a filmmaker's reputation, um, you know, I know a lot, uh, I'm in a I'm in a quarantine film club with a bunch of filmmakers who you know have all made like one or two you know mid six figure films, and the you know consensus is that like even when you're working at that level, the amount of business pressure to conform your vision is is is, is huge. Um, and so I think that you know the optimistic side wants to agree that this this could sort of lead to. Um, but you know, like the, the production realities will lead to to more adventurous work being greenlit. But um, I, I, at the same time, we were already on this path to everything conforming and it being harder and harder to get something made that 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 bucks trends. We will probably at the end of two years end up with a whole bunch of you know two million dollar YA movies. Yeah. <laughs> but I think I think um, Dan's right. But I do think there is. It could be exciting. We could actually finance people, these smaller films with these great visions. But to Mike's point, like, where are they going to go? That's, that's the thing that's, that's the thing that's terrifying me right now. I mean, we just have this model. We do these films. I work with people no one's heard of generally, you know, we get the films out there and the festival buzz and excitement is really how we sell them. So again, what, what do we do when we don't, when you don't, I read there was an article recently in Screen that talked about IDFA, um, the documentary festival, how they've really built out their site um, to point people to links uh, of their past films and their past filmmakers, and they, you know, it points directly to like a YouTube link or a VHX link or or the, you could rent the film on Amazon. So um, they said that their traffic has like exploded um, since the <laughs> since the pandemic happened. So, I mean, I thought that was really interesting. And if, you know, Sundance and South By and TIFF similarly had that kind of portal, I guess, to point people to, it might sort of fill the void of curation for a little while as these festivals, as, as we wait for a vaccine. Yeah. At, at the same time, you know, not to be overly negative, because I do believe in the overall dialectics, the yin and yang of things, um, that possibly as the uh, domination of corporate media gets focused on just a few five key players, that we may see a resurgence in um, local empowerment, um, that maybe festivals will start to finally become curators again. We have a real problem with festivals in America. <clears throat> the, the, the streamers have taken over a lot of the festival programming either directly through, do through donations um, or uh, just through uh, pressuring to have films that can sell that would be on the sites. And uh, a lot of festivals in America just follow suit of those top festivals. And there's no individual local curation going on. And very few festivals have real curation. And I think the festivals have to start with saying, you know what, we need to recognize number one, our local filmmakers. And we have to support our local voices. And um, possibly as the streamers become more dominant, maybe we all become more aware of how we need to empower ourselves locally. And that may come out in the long term out of this. But unfortunately, I do see an acceleration of corporate domination that uh, is, is going to be advanced during this time, possibly with even as going as far as buying theater chains, which I know some people think is a good thing, uh, be, you know, with AMC on the rocks. I, I, I don't, um, but uh, I, I just hope that the local independent run theaters can stay alive and I hope that local festivals can start to become more adventurous in their programming. So in bringing it back to, to the to, to production for a moment, um, where do we think that that in the in the low budget space, the non streaming studio space, where do we think that money is might be coming from for production? I mean, we you know it's already hard enough to get these films financed uh, with a shrinking economy and everybody's four hundred one ks and everything who has them going to hell. 
uh, I really do wonder where where are we finding financing, especially in a country that doesn't do it through the government and will no longer be doing practically anything through our governments, considering what's going on. Any any thoughts? Um, I think, I mean, for films and independent films that are often financed by private equity, I mean, it's going to be a huge problem. I don't think that some of the pe some people are going to be as adventuresome as they used to be. I don't know if we're really going to go way back to the model of um, literally shooting something on no money other than the money for gas, food, and lodging, which, by the way, South Mountain was exactly made that way. It's Hillary Broger's um, feature that we shot at her mom's place up in Woodstock two summers ago. Um, but even that takes money. Um, so that's really a huge question. I mean, are vendors going to start letting equipment go for free under different, this goes back to the model, like, you know, it seems like from the nineties where, you know, people were working on deferral or half deferrals, you know, vendors were deferring payment, you know, very speculative, um, you know, as you mentioned, grants and those sorts of programs that have supported a lot of filmmaking in this space, certainly the sorts of films that Mike is talking about, the sort of films that all of everyone on this panel has been involved with. I don't know. I don't know where that money is going to come from. Um, well, I mean, so we've all been involved in, in, at some point in our careers, super ultra, no budget, whatever yeah. films. Credit uh, card financed. Yeah. yeah, I mean, R Rashad, I mean, have you, uh, Dan, you guys both, I mean, it was Gun Hill Road made. How did you get Gun Hill Road made? Was that? Yeah, I mean, actually, Premature was, was self-financed, predominantly self-financed. But Gun Hill Road, um, I had a financier. Uh, Ron Simons, who was at Simon Says Entertainment, um, met with me for lunch one day and, you know, asked me what I had going on and, and said, you know, he'd like to help me out. And so that's how that uh, came about. And I was able to take it from what I thought was going to be a $50,000 film to a $500,000 film overnight. And then I got to, you know, cast actors based on the bigger budget. Uh, with Premature, knowing that I had been out of the game for a few years, I knew I was going to, you know, have to do that financing dance, which I wasn't really excited about. And I decided to just take you know, my, my years of savings from television and um, that combined with a, a dear friend of mine, uh, Susan Kaletri Watson, who helped out uh, as well as uh, Um uh, And then once we were in post and got into Sundance, uh, we had help from Astute Films and Slice Entertainment, a couple of co companies that came in um, to help us uh, through post. Uh, but yeah, for, to, to, in order to green light that film, a lot of that was, you know, just me, kind of you know, being impatient and putting down my own, you know, own credit cards and stuff. Uh, my, my film that we just, we just wrapped production on, um, from, from the very beginning, the idea was to try to write something that could be made for very little uh, and, and to not treat that as a crutch, but to treat that limitation as something that would sort of drive the artistic process. Um, the total production budget was around 100. Um, it was uh, a few companies who put in really small amounts, a production company called Dweck Productions and the Flies Collective in New York who brought a lot of in-kind as well. Um, and yeah, it was really one of those, uh, we didn't have to put anything on credit cards and everybody got paid and the structure of the film was sort of created to make something with a small group of people that was sort of arts driven. Um, and, you know, it was the sort of project that like I, I didn't try to get it financed at a big, bigger level because I, I just, I knew that like, I wanted to try to make something in the woods with people that would sort of stand on its own artistically. Um, but, you know, that's not necessarily a sustainable model. I, you know, I admire filmmakers like um, Eric Romer and Hong Sang Soo, you know, these filmmakers who have been able to like create their own models sustainably to make movies, but it's a very hard thing to do in America at a certain point. You do need, to be able to go and convince somebody who's primarily profit driven that you're worth their time. I mean, there's three, right. for, for very low budget films, there's 
basically three types of financing, grants, incentives, and equity. I think grants are all gonna go away if they're not gone already. Um, incentives are starting to disappear. I mean, New York just cut theirs um, and increased the budget threshold. So like really small films don't get to claim incentives anymore. Um, and then equity, I mean, that's the one place where it's like, you know, if you're going after like really, really wealthy people, they're, they seem to be the only ones who are sort of shielded from from uh, this pandemic a bit because they just have so much money and the government keeps helping them. Um, so perhaps they may still be incentivized to finance films, um, especially as, you know, I think there's like a thought that there might be, because there's no movies being made right now, like I think some people see um, investing in film as an opportunity um, because they think, the movies are gonna, that we make now are gonna like sell for a lot of money because there's yeah. Hollywood's not making any money movies right now, so so there's that and I don't know I'm trying to look at the the glass half full of it all. Yeah, yeah I mean in, in everything there's always there's we always have to keep our eyes out for the opportunities invariably. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also wonder though let's let's talk a little bit about the the questions of this these you know there have been a lot of articles written about what it would take to start shooting, you know, what it would take to, to and, and there were like two or three of them just came out in the last 24 hours and, you know, all kinds of stuff from, you know, quarantining cast and crew for two weeks and, and, you know, cast and crews living together or chartered flights, you know, limits to sue, to crew sizes, to barriers between DPs and for, to actors doing their own makeup and eliminating open calls, fewer takes, all of this stuff, which, you know, on paper, it all sounds great, but what's, what do we think the reality of this is on a set? And I mean, obviously when you're shooting, you know, uh, whatever Marvel movie number 25, you can control all this because it's all controlled anyway. But when you're in the middle of the country or, or upstate New York, or even in New York, uh, on a small set, what are we really thinking we can or should be doing, and what what is just an absolute like impossibility? I mean, the interesting thing about one of those articles, and I've seen a lot of them. Uh, you know, it's going to be hard to put twelve people into a fifteen-passenger van, right? Immediately, um, that's one thing I think that's that 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 directly is going to impact us. I think if you're an extra that survives from big extra, um, large amount of extra work, I think extra work is going to be hit, you know, and that's a big part of SAG memberships uh, income is, is extra work. And I think that that's going to be a, a, a significant problem in terms of, uh, you know, lead actors going to the places that are safe, which right now the top of the place, the, the countries you want to be in to shoot your film are, are New Zealand, Germany, and, and South Korea they're going to have the quarantine thing, you know, in Australia. When, if you're an, an actor and you land to shoot in New Zealand, you're going to be in a hotel room for two weeks and it's going to be good for those countries because it's going to limit the crew uh, that can come in. And those are the places that are going to get, I think, the big productions because they're geared up and they have the stage base and they're ready to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that we're going to see a lot more small crew. And um, I think that the question for indie is low budget indie is we don't really have that kind of closed environment stage reliance. We're generally an exterior driven, um, you know, uh, type of film. And so that's gonna be a challenge, I think, for us. Yep. And in terms of, uh, I mean, even, you know, do we have any suggestions that we'd like to to offer for for the unions? I mean, SAG after a, uh, just changed the low budget agreements uh, before this whole thing hit. There's negotiations about to begin because they're going to change again. Uh, I'm curious what you guys think. I mean, uh, you know, the notion of if you have to, you know, quarantine actors for a couple weeks, that means you got to pay those actors for a couple mm -hmm. more weeks. And pay uh, the hotel and the food, and it's very expensive. Yeah, on the films I work on, that would be really impossible. We just yeah. couldn't do that. That's like, that's impossible now. <laughs> that would be like shooting another movie. I mean, that's like going to say that. We could, shoot, we could shoot at least a short for that. So, right. Um, so, I, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity in the way we all usually work on these films. But again, if, if they set rules like that, it's going to be quite, quite difficult at our budget level. So. 
I think you're probably going to see a lot more films that are written for one room. Yeah. <laughs> with, with one person. <laughs> with like a three, three to four person crew. A two-hander. A lot of animals. A lot of animals. Like a field. <laughs> a lot of exteriors, yes. Fields, right. Yeah, that works too. Middle of nowhere. Right. Actually, do I was one of my questions for for towards the end was asking what what don't we want to see being made about right now? <laughs> like what? to see people in face masks on screen. No, um, it's a good question. Um, I don't know. Some some you know this could be a very kind of fertile time for creativity. Um, I can't say what I don't want to see, but um, on a creative side, there might be some very smart and interesting projects coming out that are just more um, touching on cultural aspects that this whole pandemic has really started to expose and economic disparity and, and all sorts of stuff. So I'm, again, I'm, I'm being optimistic that this might be an actual creative time I'd, I, on that note, I'd like to see the rise of actor empowerment to the extent that the webisode would come back. So mm -hmm. I'd like to see, you know, the, the kind of thing that gave birth to high maintenance and, and Broad mm -hmm. City is just like actors get together in a park bench mm -hmm. with, a, with a phone and make webisodes and get it uploaded. And that's, I hope that's the first bit of production that comes back is actors mm -hmm. making their own shows in the webisode form. I think that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. I love that. We were just talking about that the other day. It's it is absolutely time to bring the webisode. It's so empowering. It's just yeah. fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The best thing that came out of that tech, this technology is the webisode. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Totally agree. But I do think that a lot of people are actually getting a fair amount of writing done. Like one of my directors on Freeland wrote a whole fantastic script last month. And again, not to say that everybody has to, a lot of people can't even think straight to write a script right now, but he wrote something incredible. And uh, he just, cause he suddenly was like, okay, I'm not going to festivals, uh, you know? And, and so I think there's a lot of that going on too. Yeah. And on the film that we couldn't shoot the last uh, week of, we actually had a really great idea about how to end that film now, which we would not have had if we had mm -hmm. shot it. So there's, there are things like that too. But again, it, it all comes back to that whole point that Mike said about, uh, and everybody else has talked to, about trying to get the films out there. Like, what do we do when we get the films out there? Um, I have to say, I tend to work on, on uh, pieces where we just wanna make the movies. The, the filmmaker wants to tell their story the story has to come out. So I think those stories are still gonna come out. We don't actually, if we always thought about where are our film's gonna land, I think we wouldn't make any of them. Um, so I'm just hoping, I think that's really true. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think we're just gonna continue to, to, to barrel along. And I'm, as a producer, gonna continue to su try to support those um, new voices. And I hope that the equity investors are willing to continue to stick with us. Mm -hmm. um uh you know so i have a question for mike actually who's distributing your Le your lena olin film do you have a distributor on board we have a, the theatrical component was being serviced by strand i see got it and what do you what are your thoughts on the the two films that you have in post are you going to submit them to festivals anyway um it's, it's tough you know the jake mahaffey film reunion because it's um kind of in the horror space, the personal horror, um, we're, going, we're going straight out to the streamers. So, you know, what we're definitely seeing now is that the streamers are willing to look right away, right? Because the festival component's taken out of it and Jake is somebody that won his last film, won best film in Venice, Horizon. So, you know, there's, there's that level of quality that comes with it, so they'll look at it. Mm -hmm. The other one, I'm just gonna hold. You know, I'm in, I'm in with the other one that's just a real festival film that I shot in South New Orleans. It really needs a festival audience. There's no other way it can come into the world except through a festival. Right. Um, that's the only captive audience that this kind of film has, which is very oblique, very slow. And slow films need big screens. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm just going to take the hit, you know, and I'm just going to, we're going to wait for 
you know, these festivals to come back and maybe catch the tail end, you know, uh, in, in the fall. But uh, I got no choice with that film. Festivals are important for certain types of slow films, so. But with just, you don't, think it's, you don't think it's worth it just to like slap on a Locarno logo or slap on a Venice logo, you know, even if those fests don't happen. Is that helpful for the marketing, you think? Possibly, but the reason that made me jump quick was because I heard the call went out for product and that the, that the, that the, that the streamers were ready to look and wanting to buy and that there's a buying energy. Got it. And, um, you know, to be honest, you know, Jake being at, at Venice again or even Toronto or anything, it's not going to make that appetite for the streamers, you know, that much more. Right. So I'm trying to do a sale. So yep. Makes sense. That, that energy, the, the, there's that kind of buying energy right now. Yep. So with the festivals, I, I do also wonder, I, I got a, actually a call earlier today from a young guy straight out of, you know, film school, kind of asking for advice of how to get into the biz, you know, one of those like <laughs> moments where you're like, really, are you asking me this, me? Um, okay. Uh, but, you know, every answer I was giving him sounded like an answer I would have given him three or four months ago. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, with film festivals, so much of what they are, aside from being markets and being ways to get uh, press and some word of mouth is, is a means of, of um, networking and meeting, you know, not just the folks you want to sell your films to, but the people that you want to make your next ones with. Uh, if the festival market is going to shrink, this festival world is going to shrink, uh, which I think it's going to. I mean, we're going to see a lot of less festivals after this. There's no way they're all going to survive. Mm. Um, what do we think? How do you? How do young filmmakers, new filmmakers, kind of meet their their posse and 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 uh, uh, move forward? I've been really. Um, there has been like a, a, an interesting social aspect to quarantine, at least among filmmakers that I've seen online and. Um, you know, especially in like the immediate aftermath, just seeing like DIY theaters setting up Twitch streams of movies that were screening 24 seven and filmmakers congregating in the chats. I just logged on for my friend Marnie's um, online Q&A uh, for a virtual screening of her amazing film Crestone that was slated to premiere at South by Southwest, but is now was temporarily available online. Uh, I, I've mentioned this before, but like I, I just joined a film club with a bunch of filmmakers. There are opportunities, what Zia Anger has been doing with um, her live performance of um, my first film, which is uh, this, this live performance that she does with the film that she made several years ago. She's been booking 800 people a night and doing sort of an interactive performance with them online with her film. People are finding ways to communicate virtually um, what I think is still missing or what the question mark is for new films is is what the equivalent in the short term, at least of the Locarno Laurel is online. You know, if you don't want to wait years for the festival circuit to reestablish itself, what are new ways that people can stand out and establish themselves, uh, you know, in the, in the virtual space? I will say that I'm a lot more available now. You know, so if there's like, um, you know, young f filmmakers that need mentorship or anything like that, like people have more availability on their hands to uh, mentor or, you know, respond and go through their email inbox and answer, you know, and just, or, or do panels or, you know, whatever it is, it seems like a lot of people have the ability now to help out in ways that they weren't able to help out before. And in terms of work, you know, I think that, you know, this, the streaming demand, it, you know, for content is, is going to increase and we're at maximum capacity in New York, Atlanta, um, in terms of crew base. And so, and New Mexico to, a, to an extent, I think that the, the, the production centers in the United States is going to expand. Um, and that, you know, a lot of these new TV shows, you know, we're, we're backed up. They've got to finish the old shows. And all of that space was is booked, and I think young people or emerging filmmakers need to think of themselves as you know people who are working on other shows 
and those need to get redefined, those cities outside of New York and Atlanta. And I think communities can form among young filmmakers in other places now. And I just, I don't, I think, I think this event is going to break the kind of New York Atlanta control or New Mexico control over production. And I feel like we're going to get a more diversified, spread out uh, sense of production uh, centers. And hopefully they'll have their own local situations. But I think it, that's a positive thing, I think. Mm -hmm. I do really, uh, I just want to also say, I really feel for filmmakers who were supposed to be on the circuit with their first or second film. Yeah. I've been on calls too. with people, like last night I was on a call with somebody who was supposed to be premiering his film mm -hmm. at the Maryland Film Festival that night. And, uh, you know, That's especially crazy. when you're just starting out to lose that year of your life when you should be out there meeting people and sharing the thing with actual live human beings. It, it, and celebrating all your incredibly hard work, you know? Yeah. Exactly. And I cool. mean, the festival circuit is also kind of one of the few perks that we get, you know, when we yeah. do these things. It's, it's, I don't think you can replicate that on a Zoom call, you know? No, you can't. I'll tell you what, one interesting thing that hopefully Manette can talk to at least a little bit. I did find it fascinating, the, um, the initial release of, of Swallow and other films in drive-in theaters was a brilliant idea That's and who great. saw that coming. Wouldn't that be cool to drive in theaters? Yes. Well, they are, they're cropping up all over the place. Um, just to give you a little background, Swallow was released at the Ocala Drive-In in, in Florida, a, a very conservative part of Florida. Um, and it was the number one movie at the box office for two weeks because of that. Um, it's it great. Double feature with um, another IFC film, um, The Other Lamb, and then Resistance the following week. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, since then, there have been a lot of drive-in theaters cropping up. Um, apparently, it's really easy to start a drive-in theater, you know, like to purchase a screen and like, you know, there's tons of empty parking lots. Um, so uh, yeah, I think, I, I think there's like things reopening, like New York, apparently there were no drive-in theaters in New York until last week because Cuomo issued permits to let them open up and and um yeah so they're they're all cropping up and that could be a thing i mean i feel like um i feel like in the interim you know during this pandemic while the indoor theaters are closed i do think that drive-ins and outdoor theaters are um cropping up so that's promising no it does there's there's one up here that's been open whether they're, they're supposed to be or not and it's great because they do they do the big release films, but they also do a lot of classic um, 70s films, indie films, but I think that's, I loved hearing that story that you just gave. That's wonderful. <laughs> it's awesome. So I know a lot of people have been, um, uh, you know, every time I hear people talking about, what are you watching, what are you watching? It's always TV, 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 TV. So I wanna know what you guys are watching that are movies in the last two, three, four weeks. We did Save uh, and Tango, which uh, got a virtual release from the Film Society of Lincoln Center. That was a fun way to spend seven hours. How, how did that work on the on the small screen? I, it was beautiful. We think, you know, we've got like a 50 inch TV, thankfully. So, uh, I mean, the restoration is, is incredible. And, yeah. um, you know, that's a film that is, puts you in a slow mindset, but isn't necessarily boring, you know, it holds your, holds your attention in a, in a nice way. It's a good way to spend a couple mornings over a weekend. The screenings, the screenings that were done at Lincoln Center, they had to do it twice. I went twice, two different times. The first one and the second one, it was, they were practically sold out. It was amazing how, how good it was, how well attended. We've been, we have two teenage sons, so we've been sort of going to Criterion and, and going back and watching, uh, let's see, what have we been watching? Parallax View, we just watched um, Taxi Driver, just kind of entered, a, I think we're going to watch Deer Hunter and maybe Clute this week. Um, so we're kind of revisiting some kind of seminal American films. I haven't had time to watch anything. I've been, watching, I've been watching my two films and posts, many cuts of those, <laughs> and developing scripts. Yeah. 
I've been watching a lot of documentaries. Uh, watched uh, they they call, uh, I called him Morgan on Netflix. Um, I'm watching Amadeus now. I watch Burning. Just basically catching up on a lot of film yeah. that I hadn't seen in a while, or or ha have been on my list to see. Yeah, I, I watched Crestone, which was amazing during that time. And then I watched uh, Eliza Hittman's film, uh, Never Rarely, Sometimes Always, which is great. And Crip Camp. I keep wanting to, yes. I keep seeing everybody yes. like Dan, everybody posting about all this like really great stuff they're watching. But just I keep, uh, I keep being sort of busy. I'm also reading some books, which I haven't had time to do because I was in post for so long, so. I've been, I've been catching up on the old Bong Joon-ho that I should have known. Quite a, lot, a long time ago. Um, so, all right, great. I mean, I, I'll, I'll wrap this up if, if uh, I think we're, we've covered a lot of ground here and I appreciate it. Um, I will quickly wrap it up with one quick quote from uh, the legendary manager, uh, Shep Gordon, who was featured in the, the documentary Supermensch, where he said that every time he has a, a client who's down on their luck or hasn't had a job or a hit in a long time, his whole position was just stay in the water, just stay in the water. You don't have to tread the water, just stay in it and eventually things will come back. So keep the faith. Thanks for uh, participating in this and, and uh, best of luck to everybody in your projects. Keep in touch. Good to see everybody. It's great to see everyone. Thanks. Bye. Take care.